few moments. Meditate on the Divine Lord and pray for the peace and happiness of the humanity. Om Stapakaya Chadamasya Sarvadharma Swarupine Stapakaya Chadamasya Sarvadharma Swarupine Avatar Varishthaya Rama Krishna Yate Ramana Asatoma Sat Gamaya Tamasoma Jyote Gamaya Pratyorama Mritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Let us offer our salutations to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate, let us pray to him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. We have been reading Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and discussing some of the topics taken from the Gospel. Sri Ramakrishna's profound wisdom how Sri Ramakrishna has through his spiritual instructions or he is trying to remove our ignorance and taking us near to God. All his teachings are so simple very forceful and direct. Sri Ramakrishna has dealt with so many topics so I am just taking the theme Sri Ramakrishna's profound teachings How Sri Ramakrishna, in a very simple way, has said that though God is present, but He is invisible. Because God is invisible, people think. Where is God? God cannot be seen through our gross eyes. We require special <coughs> divine eyes to look the divine form of God. You see in Bhagavad Gita also when Lord Krishna wanted to give 
the cosmic vision to arjun first he made him have divya chakshus then only he could see the cosmic form of lord krishna how the whole universe is moving on everything was revealed in that cosmic form arjun could not have seen that through his ordinary eyes it requires subtle eyes to see that special vision so shri ramakrishna explains it in a very nice way the stars in the daylight are not visible but night they are visible because they are not visible in daytime do you conclude stars are not there so shri ramakrishna is trying to teach a lesson through this simile like stars in the daylight god is invisible but then can you therefore say that there are no stars in the sky during the day because you can't find god in the days of your ignorance say not that there is no god so ignorance is the obstacle ignorance that's why in my prayer i just chanted darkness of ignorance so as long as we are in ignorance we are in dark so the cause of all suffering is because of the ignorance so we must get rid of this ignorance by practicing whatever yoga but ignorance must be destroyed so shri ramakrishna is making very clear that god is present positively god is real in the absolute sense and god can be seen very emphatically shri ramakrishna has said these things these are not mere words he himself did tremendous spiritual practices mind was thoroughly fit to have the vision of the divine and so when the mind was in that high state of purity shri ramakrishna had the wonderful vision of the divine so when he saw that divine form he was overwhelmed with joy he totally lost all outward consciousness he was just absorbed in that supreme joy of being at the lotus feet of the divine mother and that experience made him realize that the whole universe is being carried on by the supreme will of the divine mother so shri ramakrishna when he talks about spirituality he is 100% certain of what he was talking and he would make 
the aspirants inclined to do spiritual practices he would give clear instructions to them so that they may do sadhana regularly and steadily <coughs> regularity and steadiness are important in achieving the result in spiritual life again shri ramakrishna gives another simile to explain a profound spiritual teaching he says a million zeros mean nothing without the number 1 zeros get their value of hundreds and thousands when placed after the numeral 1 so without that accompanying 1 they are valueless likewise all things get their value from their connection with god first comes god and only then next the jivas the embodied beings the souls and the jagat the world so all these things become meaningful when they are connected to god if you don't have that concept of god then all other things become meaningless <coughs> so also regarding work <coughs> people all the time they are engaged in work some type of work they always keep doing either physical work or intellectual work or any mental activity everything is considered work but what type of work people are doing that's important so simply doing work doesn't purify you if you have to have purification it must be done in a proper way So Sri Ramakrishna tells, when a person works for God, his work acquires great value. When he forgets about God and just works for himself, however grand his achievements, they all remain valueless. how nicely sri ramakrishna has given these teachings by giving similes apt similes so anybody can really understand the sublime truths said by sri ramakrishna the gospel is full of such similes and instructions on spiritual life again shri ramakrishna distinguishes between the wise one and the learned one who is wise and who is learned again he gives an analogy two friends went into a mango orchard the first one got very busy in counting the trees and branches and twigs and uh, the number of leaves and he was trying to estimate the number of mangoes in order to find out the uh, value of the orchard so he was busily engaged in such type of 
work. So his intellect was being used in just exploring the things. But there's another person, he was a wise one. How? He just got friendship with the owner of the orchard and after talking with him for a while the owner himself offered him some mangoes to eat and he was so happy to taste the mangoes and he did not waste his time in just counting the twigs and branches of the mango trees and evaluating the value etc. <coughs> So, you could be like the vain man of learning, trying to discover the why and wherefore of the universe. Of course, there is a limit for your questioning, but you can't keep on questioning until the end. The questions must have to stop at one stage. Yato vacho nivartante. God is beyond the reach of the worlds. So, the humble man of wisdom, how he considers the play of the universe, he just tries to connect himself with the Creator, the Supreme God. He just wants to concentrate on seeing the Divine Form. And once he gets into that state of bliss, then he will know everything. He has no questions to ask at all. All the questions dissolve. So, that is another test of uh, spirituality. When there are no more questions in the mind, that means you have raised to a higher level in thinking. We have heard in the life of great Saint Ramana Maharshi, some of the Westerners, they would go with critical mind, and some of them had lots of uh, questions bothering them. They thought by talking with him and discussing him all these questions, uh, they would become peaceful. So with such ideas they would come to see Ramana Maharshi. And Ramana Maharshi was a great admirer of silence. He would not talk at all. Just he would be simply sitting quietly with a serene look and his mind was on the high state of bliss and just by sitting near him, around him, for a while, maybe half an hour or one hour, afterwards they would all get up and go. What happened to their questions? Somebody asked, oh, all our questions dissolved. We felt tremendously peaceful. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of the great spiritual persons. When you just go near them, you feel tremendous peace. It's a fine state of experience. We have seen in the life of uh, the direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Brahmananda Ji, there's an instance among the monastics, you know, there are so many types of novices. 
some are new some are uh, staying there for a long time so wherever there are many people there's bound to be some kind of friction some some kind of irritation or some such things it's quite natural if you live alone that question doesn't arise <laughs> so in fact there is a place where all your angularities are straightened up <coughs> you will be able to <coughs> you will be able to understand each other and adjust yourself properly and evolve in a right way well the matter was reported to swami brahmananda ji you see his portrait here in the shrine he said he call all of them all the monastic brothers were called in they were all sitting in front of brahman ji and brahman ji sat for a while then he went and touched every one who was sitting there that's all next moment they are all tremendously peaceful all their irritations are gone and they are feeling tremendous love towards one another <coughs> and they felt the great spiritual effect of being sitting near brahman ji and they sat there for a while and they all felt extremely blessed so that's the way so a person who is really wise he does not waste time in unnecessary things he just focuses focuses on the point to be done and then he feels immensely satisfied <clears throat> so that's the uh, supreme value of the persons of spiritual eminence and again shri ramakrishna uh, compares these spiritual teachers through a simile he takes the example of bees the bees are naturally attracted to flowers ants make their own way to a spot where there are sweets moths fly instinctively towards a flame so also is the power of a spiritual master the spiritual teacher has no need to invite people to his sermons such is his magnetism that people by themselves come on their own accord seeking instructions from him but then it is not very easy to seek the spiritual teacher you must have some initial purification of the mind you must have some kind of uh, little taste towards spirituality little awakening is required to seek the spiritual teacher but sometimes somehow people will come to know and go and meet the spiritual master and get spiritual directions but then one has to practice them then only one gets the benefit again shri ramakrishna takes another simile and gives an important teaching through that simile when a tourist comes into a new city what he would do the first thing what he would do 
he finds himself a comfortable room and keeps all his baggage there and then goes out sightseeing first he finds out a lodging place to keep his things then he goes out freely likewise a person should first speak spiritual wisdom the first priority is spirituality first you must acquire spiritual wisdom and then go out in pursuit of material ambitions you will never lose your peace of mind but very few people do this way because their material ambitions overpower them and they have lost all control over the mind and spirituality means nothing for them and there's no end for their material ambitions they keep on multiplying they keep on engaging him in different types of uh, actions so months and years he will be involving himself more and more and more and more and when the old age comes he will be in a state of helplessness all the senses go in their own way and he will have no control he cannot control because he has no power to control all the power is gone whatever power he had it's all used up so old age is nothing but a burnt out stage is totally burnt so even if he wants to think of god he cannot because mind is not trained in the beginning and you can't expect the mind to come suddenly when you want it to think about god it's not easy it is extremely difficult maybe there are exceptions one or two but normally speaking throughout their life how they have conducted their activities that leads them in their future life so all the spiritual teach teachers say very clearly that in your formative period give at most importance to establish yourself in spiritual values have a good spiritual foundation do everything that is possible to maintain that then everything goes well and everything becomes meaningful <coughs> shiram krishna gives another example magnet and the iron how nicely these analogies the similes are given it has tremendous significance and so nicely taught so shri ramakrishna there he tells a person thickly embedded in maya is like a piece of iron thickly embedded in mud just like the iron is unmoved by the power of the magnet so also the person is unaffected by the lord because of the covering of the mud when the mud is washed away with water then the iron becomes free likewise when maya is washed away how with prayer worship spiritual disciplines then that person is automatically drawn towards god is just drawn towards god <clears throat> so discover brahman and maya in the ocean shri ramakrishna tells in another place brahman and maya are like these two states 
of the ocean when the ocean is tranquil and at rest it is like brahman when it is turbulent and restless it is like maya the restlessness of maya is mostly on the surface of the ocean but the deeper you go within your own self the nearer you get towards brahman and the quieter and more peaceful it seems and again he shri ram takes explains the role of brahman and maya in creation both brahman and maya are necessary for creation otherwise creation cannot function so brahman is shiva maya is shakti brahman is intelligence maya is energy no potter can make a pot with dry clay what is essential for its creation so also shiva alone cannot create without the help of shakti shiva is to shakti what fire is to its burning property a snake will not be affected by the poison in its own fangs but when it bites the poison can kill the victim likewise maya in brahman does not affect him while the same maya can delude the whole world when the supreme being is actionless neither creating nor sustaining nor destroying he is brahman or purush but when he is active creating sustaining and destroying he is called shakti or maya or prakriti all these names belong to the same supreme god so the actionless brahman and the active shakti are in fact inseparable like a precious stone and its luminosity you can't simply imagine one without the other so what is the relationship between brahman maya and the embodied soul that also shri ramakrishna explains giving a very good simile when shri ramachandra sita and lakshman went as exiles into the forest shri ramachandra led the way with sita following him and lakshman behind her lakshman was anxious to see rama always he wanted to see rama but he could not see rama within his sights but the only time he could get a full view of rama was when sita moved aside such is the arrangement of brahman maya and the embodied being in the world as long as illusion or maya does not move aside we the jeevas cannot see brahman brahman and maya are mixed together like milk and water only a paramahamsa a mythical swan can separate milk from water maya can destroy when a cat catches her kitten with her teeth the kitten does not get hurt but when a mouse is caught it dies likewise maya never kills a devotee though it can destroy others so just as a cloud covers the sun so also maya hides brahman when the cloud moves away the sun becomes visible so also when maya is removed god becomes manifest so shri ramakrishna teaches us that we should become devotees once you become a devotee then maya will not bother you 
and you will not be hurt by maya anymore and you become qualified to have the vision of God. Like this, Sri Ramakrishna has given lots of spiritual teachings through similes which are very uh, nice to study and apply in our life. <coughs> Page 740. 741. Sri Ramakrishna went into Samadhi. His body was motionless. He remained in that state a long time. Gradually, he came down to the consciousness of the outer world. Still in a spiritual mood, he began to talk. Sometimes, addressing the devotees, sometimes the Divine Mother. Master said, Mother, please attract him to thee. I can't worry about him anymore. To Yam, Sri Ramakrishna said, My mind is inclined a little to your brother-in-law. To Girish, Sri Ramakrishna said, You utter many abusive and vulgar words. But that doesn't matter. It is better for these things to come out. There are some people who fall ill on account of blood poisoning. The more the poisoned blood finds an outlet, the better it is for them. At the same time, when the upadhi of a man is being destroyed, it makes a loud noise, as it were. Wood crackles when it burns. There is no more noise when the burning is over. You will be purer day by day. You will improve very much day by day. People will marvel at you. I may not come many more times, but that doesn't matter. You will succeed by yourself. The Master's spiritual mood became very intense. Again he talked to the Divine Mother. Master said, Mother, what credit is there in making a man good who is already good? O oh, Mother, what wilt thou accomplish by killing one who is already dead? Only if thou canst kill a person who is still standing erect, wilt thou show thy glory. Sri Ramakrishna remained silent a few moments. Suddenly, he said in a slightly raised voice, I have come from Dakshineshwar. I am going, mother. It was as if a child had heard the call of its mother from a distance and was responding to it. He again became motionless, absorbed in samadhi. The devotees looked at him with unwinking eyes. Still in an ecstatic mood, he said, I shall not eat any more luchi. At this point, a few Vaishnava priests who had come from the neighborhood left the place. Sri Ramakrishna began to talk with his devotees in a very joyous spirit. It was the month of April and the day was very sultry. Devendra had made ice cream. He offered it to the master and the devotees. Yam said in a low voice, Encore, Encore. The devotees laughed at the sight of the ice cream. Sri Ramakrishna was happy as a child. Master said, The Kirtan was very nice. The song described beautifully the gopi's state of mind. O oh, Madhavi, give me back my sweet one. The milkmaids of Vrindavan were drunk with ecstatic love for Krishna. How wonderful, mad for Krishna. How wonderful, mad for Krishna. A devotee, pointing to another devotee, said, he has the attitude of the gopis. Ram said, no, he has both. The attitude of tender love and the attitude of austere knowledge. 
Master said, What is it you are talking about? Sri Ramakrishna inquired about Surendra. Ram said, I sent him word, but he has not come. Master said, He gets very tired from his heavy office work. A devotee said, Ram Babu has been writing about you. Master asked smilingly, What is he writing? Devotee said, He is writing an article on the bhakti of the Paramahamsa. Master said, Good. That will make Ram famous. Giri said smilingly, He says he is your disciple. Master said, I have no disciple. I am the servant of the servant of Rama. Some people of the neighborhood had dropped in, but they did not please the master. He said, what sort of place is this? I don't find a single pious soul here. Devendra took Sri Ramakrishna into the inner apartments and offered him refreshments. Afterwards, the master returned to the drawing room with a happy face and took his seat. The devotees sat around him. Upendra and Akshay sat on either side of him and stroked his feet. The master spoke highly of the women of Devendra's family, saying, saying, they are very nice. They come from the country, so they are very pious. The master was absorbed in his own joy. In a happy mood, he began to sing. Unless a man is simple, he cannot recognize God. The simple one. God is a simple one. Again he sang, Stay your steps, O wandering monk. Stand there with begging bowl in hand and let me behold your radiant face. Once more, a mendicant has come to us. Ever absorbed in divine moods, holy alike is he to Hindu and Muslim. Giri saluted the master and took his leave. Devendra and the other devotees took the master to his carriage. Seeing that one of his neighbors was sound asleep on a bench in the courtyard, Devendra woke him up. The neighbor rubbed his eyes and said, Has the Paramahamsa come? All burst into laughter. The man had come a long time before Sri Ramakrishna's arrival and because of the heat had spread a mat on the bench, lain down and gone sound sleep. Sri Ramakrishna's carriage proceeded to Dakshineshwar. He said to him happily, I have eaten a good deal of ice cream. Bring four or five cones for me when you come to Dakshineshwar. Continuing, he said, Now my mind is drawn to these few youngsters, the younger Narain, Purna, and your brother-in-law. Master Mahesha said, Do you mean Dvija? Master said, No, he is all right. I mean his elder brother. The carriage rolled on to the Kali temple at Dakshineshwar. So that completes chapter 38. Next Tuesday we'll be starting chapter 39. Any questions to ask? So spirituality should be first priority. Spiritual life should be top most priority. Everything else afterwards. So one must aspire for spirituality. Sri Ramakrishna again and again tells it's because the mind is impure man is suffering. Once the mind becomes pure one becomes free from suffering. So purifying the mind is very important. Any question? All right. We shall stop. All right. 
chant the name of the Lord and His glory unceasingly, that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust raging furiously within. Own name streamed down in moonlight on the lotus heart, opening its cup to knowledge of thyself, O self, down, drown deep in the waves of his bliss, tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name that bath for weary selves. Various are thy names, O Lord, in each and every name thy power resides. No times are set, no rites are needful for chanting of thy name. So vast is thy mercy, how huge then is my wretchedness, who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name. O my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass, be patient and forbearing like a tree, take no honor to thyself, give honor to all, chant and seasingly the name of the Lord. O Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or revenue, the playthings of lust or the toys of fame. As many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy, consider him as dust beneath thy feet. Ah, how I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years when my heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet let me be, in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, but thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, may all be actuated by noble thoughts, may all be rejoice, may all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy, may all be free from disease, may all realize what is good, May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. May the virtuous attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good be dead all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe is satisfied. 